Okay, great. Yeah. Recording in progress. Nice. Okay, so hello, everyone. Um, so the title of this presentation is Immersive VR for Treating Deficits with uh, Social Interactions. And you see our affiliations uh, down there. And um, so here's a brief outline. Uh, I'm going to first uh, talk a little bit about the general motivation, why we and, and of course, many others uh, feel that VR could be a useful tool to treat deficits with uh, social interactions. And then I'm going to talk about those high-level uh, design principles. I'm going to talk about moderators of treatment efficacy and how we strive to optimize uh, the environment. And then Philip will take over. So let's get started. So when we think about uh, social interaction, uh, this typically uh, many people would uh, converge on the idea that this uh, yeah, involves multiple domains, things like social exchange, cooperation behaviors, competition, conflict, and, and accommodation. And it turns out that um, deficits in one or multiple of those domains, A, uh, that you have multiple uh, mental health disorders such as anxiety, depression, substance use disorder that are characterized often by deficits in social interactions. But at the same time, when people develop such deficits, this can also increase the risk to develop secondary comorbidities such as anxiety, depression. So the, seems to be something like a bidirectional relationship between mental health and, and deficits with the social interactions. Um, one uh, particular striking uh, case that, that Mark already mentioned is a social anxiety disorder. So this kind of very excessive fear of being negatively judged, embarrassed, or even humiliated during social interactions, uh, which often leads to social isolation and very strong function impairments. Um, when you look into the clinical literature, uh, you will you will see that uh, patients often wait month, if not years, uh, while their symptoms evolve before consulting a therapist, which can further uh, increase the likelihood of, of developing complications or comorbidities. So it's important to have uh, efficient and, and relatively early and quick uh, access to care for these patients. Um, we're not the first, of course, to think about uh, using VR and uh, to, to treat social anxiety disorder. And I guess one of the key motivations that you often find in the literature is that current uh, therapeutic approaches as they used in clinical settings have certain limitations. Yeah? So by far the most prevalent uh, therapeutic approach would be cognitive behavioral therapy, um, where just the behavioral component would typically consist of kind of systematic exposure to fear-provoking social situations. And the idea is that, for example, you want to try to reduce fear via mechanisms like habituation or inhibitory learning. And this, of course, would require therapists um, to create social interaction, to create social exchange, to create situations of conflict or cooperation. And this comes with a number of problems, yeah? starting from very simple logistical challenges that trying to gather a group of people who would you know, pretend uh, to engage in some social interaction. It's difficult, it's even more difficult to precisely control and adapt such, such situations. Um, just the mere thought of having to engage with other people, for example, as shown in this picture here, by giving maybe a presentation can lead to frequent avoidance behavior, that people are too anxious to even engage. And, and lastly, um, that objective measurement of symptoms can be difficult, yeah? because typically uh, people or clinicians will rely on self-reports, um, but oftentimes um, uh, this can be questioned, yeah, the validity of those self-reports. So in reality, what, when you talk to clinicians, what often happens is that they tell you, yeah, it's really hard for us to do sufficient exposure. Um, so they might do very few sessions or they might resort to what's called incensu exposure. So the patients are asked to, to rather imagine such uh, situations and then engage in social interaction in imagination. So why would then VR come in? Why would we and others think that VR could help here? Of course, there are first of all some general advantages of ex VR exposure that also apply to other uh, disorders, uh, such as A, we have uh, minimal logistics. Um, we can relatively precisely and adaptively control therapeutic scenarios, such as the behavior avatars, uh, disturbing events that might be occurring. We can combine this with more objective stress markers, um, such as uh, physiological readouts, like heart rate, heart rate variability, electrodermal activity, breathing, and others. 
and uh, this kind of safety of virtual space. So, so the idea that, okay, now you will have to interact with computer animated uh, beings and not with actual human beings can actually reduce or lower this threshold for patients to be ready and willing to engage in such a therapeutic uh, intervention. Um, what I think is sometimes maybe a bit overlooked, but what I conceive of as also a particularly interesting uh, advantage of VR is it really forces you to make your therapeutic principles and your approach very, very explicit and precise. And what do I mean by that? So here's an example from social interaction, like more fundamental research, and the idea being, okay, can mimicry lead to pro-social behavior? Because the question was asked in this particular study here by Lakin and Dahl. And uh, the idea was to say, okay, let's have avatars that react to users and that mimic their behavior in real time. It sounds very simple, but when you think about it, you actually need to be very precise. Like, okay, how fast, for example, should this mimicry occur? What actions should be mimicked? How accurately should this happen? So you need to very explicitly formulate your theory or formulate your therapeutic approach if you want to have something like a user responsive environment or user responsive avatars. I think this is actually an advantage of, of the Okay, so when we started to work on this neo mental project, we set out to uh, design a software uh, with the aim of, of treating symptoms of social anxiety disorders, uh, we thought about what principles should guide our development, what are kind of some high-level principles. And one factor that uh, we found uh, to be very important is therapeutic alliance. Yeah, so therapeutic alliance instead of uh, psychotherapy means um, that uh, you need to have things like therapeutic joint therapeutic goals, an agreement on the tasks and processes to achieve those goals, and the formation of uh, like a mutually supported bond or respective uh, connection with your therapist. And this therapeutic alliance is consistently shown to really moderate the treatment outcome. I also mean, the better this therapeutic alliance has been formed, uh, the more efficient uh, or the more, uh, yeah, uh, therapy, therapy will often be. Um, there's work showing that even if you put people in immersive VRs when they put on a headset and they lose eye contact with the therapist, that this therapeutic uh, alliance can be preserved. Yeah? So, and does this translate to VR? Indeed it does. So this is one of the kind of landmark studies on, on social anxiety disorders by Bouchard and colleagues who ran like a three-armed randomized controlled trial on social anxiety disorders that could show that VR therapy has similar effects compared to in vivo exposure, that those expect, uh, effects uh, uh, lasted for at least six months. But most importantly is that in this study, they also found therapeutic alliance to be a significant predictor of the strength of the treatment effects. Yeah, So this, this was like moderating variable, the stronger the therapeutic alliance was, uh, the larger the effects were. Secondly, um, what kind of, what should this therapeutic setting look like where this therapy should be uh, applied? There are reports uh, showing that uh, when people engage in self-guided VR therapy, where there's no therapist present and it's completely self-guided, um, that there can be uh, higher dropout rates and sometimes even significantly higher dropout rates. And there is at least as of today, relatively little research on what's called digital therapeutic alliance. So bonding or forming therapeutic alliance with the virtual therapist yeah, who would be simulated in VR. So we aim to actually preserve uh, direct patient therapist interactions. And third, um, what about presence? Yeah? So we know from research already dating back 20 years uh, and even longer um, that you can elicit symptoms of anxiety with relatively simplistic VR simulations. Yeah. For, for example, in public speaking scenario, if you have relatively artificial avatars, this can already, already elicit symptoms of anxiety. But again, dropout rates tend to be higher in patients who experience low presence, and presence can also be related to treatment outcomes. Yeah. So our approach from the get-go was to also uh, have designed both of the virtual environments and the interactions and the behavioral avatars to try to maximize uh, presence that uh, patients would feel when they engage, when they're immersed in these virtual environments. Yeah, so what does this software look like? Um, so my two final slides before I hand over to Philip. So on a very high level perspective, um, what we tried to uh, implement were certain aspects or certain principles in the environment. And one of those principles is expectation matching. And that basically means 
uh, that we want to create environments that the user can relate to. So if, if someone is, is entering, say, I don't know, a library, for example, it should look like a library that he or she would be experiencing in the cultural setting where they are in, so in the country they live in, the city they live in. Secondly, we wanted to have like, we did not want to have like objects, parts of the environment that could be somewhat peculiar, somewhat out of place, that could be somewhat kind of um, disrupting the experience. Um, and this also um, relates to, to the third plan, which is idle avatar behavior. So when you think of social interactions, you have maybe multiple people there, you will not engage or interact with everyone simultaneously. There will be people who are just standing there or sitting there doing nothing. How should these people actually behave? How should these avatars behave? And we have developed their um, probabilistic algorithms like discrete uh, time Markov chains to actually enhance the realism of how one behavior transitions to another behavior. And this really has uh, turned out to be important. And finally, um, we also wanted to have a gradual and self-guided approach to therapeutic scenarios. This is also a common principle in exposure therapy that you don't want the patient to immediately be kind of teleported to say a room in which they have to give a talk now, but there should be some like gradual approach behavior and self-guided approach behavior. Secondly, in terms of the actual interactions, what they look like, um, we, uh, of course, one problem that you're constantly facing in VR is the uncanny, uncanny valley effect, in particular when it comes to interacting with avatar. So we included things like randomized blinking, uh, lip sync, and, and upper face emotional expressions that have been shown to reduce this risk of uncanny valley effects. Yeah. Uh, secondly, we give uh, the therapist control of those social challenges of interactions with uh, with avatars of disturbing in, uh, events so that the therapist can on online and like on a moment by moment basis decide which event should be elicited now uh, what challenge should be evoked at any given moment in time this also uh, this also pertains to the dialogues yeah? meaning that uh, we want to have their give therapists full control of the dialogues to really avoid breaks of presence. This is something, for example, that has been observed when people engage in conversation with chatbots, and that sometimes dialogues can take, uh, can go into all directions, which in VR in particular can lead to breaks in presence. And finally, of course, we want to have a variability of social interactions. Uh, so I've mentioned those five domains before. So we're trying to implement situations of conflict, uh, social exchange, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is kind of a more high level uh, overview and introduction into the project and the software. And I would now stop my screen sharing and hand over to Philip, and then you will see what it actually looks like. So thank you. Okay, I should be done, Philip. Thank you, Thomas. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, oh no, how do I get to the presentation mode now? <laughs> One second, sorry. Are we in full screen now? Yes, okay, thank you. Give me a thumbs up. Um, okay, thank you, Thomas, yes. As Thomas said, um, he gave a little bit of a theoretical basis and background. Uh, I want to talk more particularly about the software itself, a little bit uh, take you into the development process as you are also in an incubator and in a, uh, on an institute where you will develop certain ideas for virtual reality. I want to show you a little bit our process and uh, but start with the approach and start with explaining the project uh, a little bit on a higher level. So what Tom has already gave you is um, the yeah, clinical research basis that our software is based upon. We talk to experts in the field of, at the beginning, anxiety research, but also therapists that are experts on ex exposure. Um, looked into several clinics and practices and looked how do they actually work, um, what is possible, what is, for example, minor things like how uh, tech-savvy are people that will use our software. Um, I can already spoiler that they're not very tech savvy. And then uh, what would be one of the yeah, strongest pillar uh, within the NeoMento project is the software development. We have a lot of people on board that are particularly not 
coming from science um, or research, but that are experts more in UX design, UI design, software designers, 3D artists. Um, as we're located in Berlin, there's a really nice pool of people you can work with who come more from the, yeah, with the aesthetical background. Um, I, I wanted to show you quickly who are the people responsible for um, the, the main tasks. Um, Michael is very interesting because I will finish with talking a little bit about the implementation of the software in the German um, clinical realm. Um, myself, I'm, I'm responsible to listen to the therapists and to research and then translate everything to uh, Dr. Adam Streck and the development team. And Thomas, you just heard talking, who is the like, uh, yeah, father of the idea, I would say, and was uh, hosting our project for several years. Now we became a spin-off um, with uh, some hypotheses that uh, Thomas already explained that it seems to be very important that um, we have a tool that is easy to use, a tool that has um, a close encounter or like a, a close relationship to real life, what uh, patients usually experience in real life um, when they have anxiety on, or when they um, have a, 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 a craving, when they have uh, alcohol use disorder, for example. And um, it seems to be very important that this software is actually uh, immersive if you use virtual reality, meaning that um, really the patient feels presence within the situation is not disrupted as Thomas already explained, but also the UX is very crucial, meaning it is very important that when a therapist is presented with the idea to use um, virtual reality therapy, because they in the end for us are kind of the gatekeepers, um, that they know how to use it and that they wanna use it. The first step there is that it looks rather appealing. And the second is that it's easy to use. So that's why we also worked with UX designers and work with certain principles from software development to keep it easy. And um, we know from science that certain programs don't do that, um, but we really have to do that uh, to become integrated into the, the healthcare system because it's a very stressful job to be a therapist. You don't have much time. Um, they also don't have much extra time to learn it. So we needed to develop something that is very easy and quickly uh, understandable and to use. We decided in the end to take high level VR because of all these points that we talk about, but also because the therapist then will sit in front of a computer as everyone is used to by now and can go through um, all the steps within therapy on a computer screen. Um, we also had thoughts about when Metaverse came up and all these idea of standalone, maybe we should use shared virtual reality where the therapist and the patient are in virtual reality together. From our experience um, on the market as we are right now, that is not really realistic that a lot of therapists would, uh, would adapt that idea. Um, we are teaching therapists to use our software. Um, we use this headset because we tested a lot of headsets. There's a lot of good headsets out there, but uh, for this tethered approach, we, we thought that the HTC um, is for us at the moment, the best one. Um, that is also due to the fact that it uses external tracking and it uses a cable. So there is the least amount of breaks. Uh, that is also something that is very crucial to us as a very, very small team and company. Um, the more breaking points we have, uh, the more we need to look for where something didn't work. Um, and the more often um, therapists would become yeah, frustrated or patients wouldn't, become, wouldn't get the therapy uh, that they need. So we use the setup that is very yeah, high level. It's, the idea is, um, so to say, that we create a hub where a therapist can, by button press, create an environment um, do exposure at its heart, um, but we also learned that um, trainings of social skills are important for, for other implications too. And what we also learned in practice without even wanting that, that also in the field of diagnostics, even without using biomarkers, it's very interesting to not only hear your patient talk about their experience in certain situations, but to experience it with the patient together. Um, we heard anecdotes or stories from therapists that we work with that they said they 
didn't know um, how uh, a patient would act um, when they when they encounter other different people and then all of a sudden they took on a children's voice for example when they started to stand in front of the the virtual audience which they didn't do before when they talked to the therapist um, also that maybe it was just a side note that they are afraid of public transport when they tried in vr they realized it's not only a side note it's a it's a highly symptomatic uh, implication that needs to be treated um, so yeah that is also then with its diagnostic qualities but in general, what we want from VR is that we can control it. We can um, use a doses that usually is not possible with exposure, and that it's uh, yeah, that it's something that that you can use easily and over and over again. Um, I I want to skip this slide. This is just again we know there's many virtual reality uh, applications out there. We don't really believe in mobile VR in our project. Um, there's a lot of force into a standalone VR right now, but we still work with Tether due to our approach, um, which is that the therapist and the patient are in one room. The therapist um, basically puts the patient or helps the patient to go into the situation and then can control in the pre-settings what will happen. So there are certain things that can't be changed during therapy, like if they have to give a presentation, how many people are in the room, um, how many people are on the way to the room in front of the in front of the entrance and um, in which room do they want to go are there uh, people of the same age or are there people um, of authority in the room are there more women or men those are things you can't change dynamically but you can uh, discuss with your patient beforehand and then change in the pre-settings so you can adjust the situation to the needs of the of the patient in its basis um, so that's then the situation that uh, we would encounter in these clinics or practices that use our software. The therapist here, uh, he's turned around just so you see the screen. In this case, um, we're in this seminar room, classroom with a patient with social anxiety and the patient has to give a speech. And the therapist here on the left hand side, you see it very small. I will show it a little bit later um, in detail. Um, can talk to the patient basically via the dialogues that have been spoken by actors. We tried it ourselves at the beginning, but it didn't sound good at all and didn't sound realistic. To be honest, the actors also had some problems to sound realistic because they're used to acting. And uh, yeah, but now we have a really nice system. Um, as Thomas already spoke about, um, this is what the, what the patient sees. Um, this would be the active character, I, I hope you can see my arrow, but on the right hand side, the, the person that's lifting their hand is the active character and they uh, will speak to the patient and the other characters will be in this Markov chain loop of behavior um, that nothing is off-putting in the room. And the room is made to be complex enough um, to be, yeah, to have a heavy processing load and that um, we have a realistic situation of encountering uh, such a complex social environment. There's, there's certain tiny tricks in there, like everything is a little bit tilted, nothing is really straight, there's little marks um, on the back wall to keep the brain busy, and also all the movements will, will then uh, construct this holistic situation and the holistic feeling of uh, social presence, which is something we also hear from people who don't have social anxiety, um, that, that this software actually, that you wanna react to the people and you feel like you're engaged, especially when somebody starts talking to you. Here you can see the person in the front row talking um, with a system on the left hand side where we have a progressive story within the interaction. It's always or sometimes it starts with a with a hello uh, and ends with a goodbye here because it's a, an audience situation. Somebody will raise their hand. They will ask a question and then they will thank the, the um, thank for the answer so you have this flow you can go through every time you feel like there is interaction needed or it it makes sense right now as thomas said because we didn't want to do any automated approach um, and give the control to the therapist to do it in the right situation at, at the right time and not break immersion um, another example here um, for yeah, social skills training or social anxiety we're at a city square here that you can also use for agoraphobic patients 
In this case, it's a very uncomfortable situation that in public um, you will run into a police control and you will be asked about your yeah, uh, personal information, but you will also be like uh, accused of things in public uh, that is also very difficult for, for people to endure, especially if they suffer from social anxiety. Um, yeah, so um, we now have um, about five to six environments that you can adjust. Um, again, what was very important to us at the beginning that we discussed a lot because it's hard in virtual reality is we also have the paths to into the scenario. So people will start walking in a very neutral room through noise and through the change of the environment. They will slowly um, yeah, raise their fear or their feeling of something is about to come that, that I need to deal with and that I might have problems with dealing. And so the, the, this approach avoidance behavior can be simulated. Um, I wanna show you a little bit uh, the development process now from the start. Um, I thought that might be interesting to you. And so yeah, as we already said, we always start with literature and then what the second step is that we do interviews with practitioners from the, the particular field what they usually do. We also use manuals to look into those. And then we end up with uh, experts in the field usually uh, that, that get hooked to the project and that inform us in our development um, all the time. We also give the software then to, to practitioners uh, when we have the first versions and see how it works and see what they want adjusted. So we have certain collaborations with clinics uh, and uh, research in institutes. One um, very simple example of our development would be fear of heights. Uh, that's always one of the easiest examples anyway in virtual reality. We always use a reference and then we kind of tilt it to our needs. Like this is a TV tower in Stockholm. In the end, our uh, environment looked like this because we wanted it to be more noisy, more overwhelming. We didn't need certain aspects in the tower, but certain aspects we liked. So this was then our final environment and this is our fear of heights training. Um, on a similar example, I wanna show you our newest project um, where we also, yeah, we, we learned, uh, got to know a team of um, alcohol um, use disorder researchers or like addiction researchers at the Charité in Berlin, uh, a very good team. And when they saw our software with the social interaction, they said, hey, you can also use this for alcohol use disorder. We really should do something, which is what we're doing right now. And you can see the first step here um, on, the, on the very right, you can see our 3D artist, Karim, um, I was in a, in a dive bar with him several times, actually. Um, people found it a little bit odd, like how curious we were about the surrounding. Um, but in the end here, the, the owner of the bar explained to us the walls and everything because he was very flattered that we will use this bar. And uh, this was the result. Um, so this is our first prototype for alcohol use disorder that we are developing right now. And what we're working on a lot is the liquids. Those are new challenges to us at the moment, but also the interaction with the drinks and the interactions um, to, receive, to receive a drink, but also to deny a drink. There are certain um, exposure trainings and, and, and uh, procedures that we know that we wanna simulate. Uh, and that's what we're working at right now. Here you can see like detailed processes, like how hard it is now here we, we I just got an image from, from the TV artist where we thought about how should it actually look if you look through a glass, because it's not that easy to simulate all of these things uh, in real time. Um, that is very interesting in general, the, the development of these environments, because you always need to think about who's the patient for alcohol use disorder, because they're not anxious, they're, they, they feel craving, and they're a little bit more critical about the stimuli because they're not in such a high mode of distress and of fight or flight, um, they will be a little bit more critical. Is this something I would usually consume? Is this something I know? Uh, is it wine or is it beer? So they're more particular about the stimuli. Um, and hence we're really like busting our heads right now to see how this will work to interact with alcohol and to create a realistic experience for people with alcohol use disorder. Um, during the development process of the dive bar, we learned that there should also be a nicer bar for uh, cl uh, private clinics. That several private clinics came to us in the process and were like, well, this bar 
looks great, but it's not for our patients. So in the end, now we have three environments. Basically, we came into several discussions where we now said, okay, for the, the minimum to use the product at the beginning and to test if it works, is we need two different bars uh, that have highly realistic stimuli, but we also need a living room because most of the patients will relapse um, in, in their home. And maybe here we will also introduce an avatar that will interact with them and uh, basically induce craving and, and push them to drink. Uh, and we call this the social pressure task. So all of these interactions um, that we're creating now, we're trying to apply to, to many different use cases besides social anxiety disorder. Um, here you can see another example. This is something we want to introduce then in our suit for, for alcohol use disorder. This is what you see as a therapist when uh, they engage, like the patient engages into a situation here. The, the task is please disrupt these people in what they are doing. And when they, uh, the, the therapist or, uh, will push a button, this happens, uh, the panel for the dialogues opens up and the people will focus on the patient. So this is kind of the beginning of an interaction and those are various interactions that we have in the software that you can use. Um, Really quickly, um, I, I don't know, I will use five more minutes if that's okay. Um, really quickly, I want to talk to you about uh, what the perception is um, in the German clinical landscape. What we do right now is uh, we go to, to scientific fairs, to clinical fairs, and we check uh, or we, we, we talk to practitioners, we talk to clinicians and see how they how they like the approach. We can see that there, because there are other providers of virtual reality therapy there, that they usually end up at our booth and say, hmm, this is much nicer because I think we take so much time developing the environments and making them nicer. And they are in the end, as I already mentioned, the gatekeepers. So they look, they look at the scientific evidence, they look at uh, what, are the, what are the mechanisms, they know what they usually do. But in the end, they will just also by feeling um, the software by using the software by trying it uh, evaluate if it's something that that they're interested in. Um, we also do that in clinics that we give presentations and speeches and show the software to to therapists. They can try it. We always have this very critical first touch usually, um, especially when it's not behavioral therapist. We have some psychoanalysts discussions behind us that were rather yeah difficult and uh, we always get the questions from people who didn't um, have encountered with virtual reality like we, we always have the situation that we have people in front of us that are not very knowledgeable of virtual, real, uh, of virtual reality and want to try it and we are we realize that we need to tone it down and explain it on a very low level so when we give a presentation right now or when we present the software, we always have a magazine that explains the technology in its core, that explains that there are different technologies, the general approach, um, why we know through studies now that it works. Um, practitioners and clinics also always ask us, can you teach us how it actually works? Um, sometimes we even get asked um, if we can teach them exposure therapy, if they're a psychiatrist or if they don't have CBT therapists there, they don't know much about exposure therapy. We also realize that we need to teach people that to a certain extent. Uh, that is something that we're working on right now, actually, that we want to create these workshops to uh, have a holistic approach on implementing the software. The problem is, I don't know if that's only in Germany. I always feel like that's a very German thing to say. It's like, we never did this before. So uh, why would we do it now? And the sentence that strikes us still the most is like, no, we don't have VR therapy, so we don't want it. Um, that is to an innovative project that is a sentence that is really hard to take sometimes. Um, but we hear that a lot, actually. In the end now, after like we kind of um, yeah, found it ourselves into Corona, that was a really hard time because nobody wanted to like invite anybody to the clinic. Um, now we have about 25 sites that use our software um, through this very hands-on approach. We deliver the software there, we help implementation, and we also do workshops. I think I want to end my talk here. Um, 
that makes sense because I'm already over time and I won't talk about like clinical cases now, but we can maybe talk about it in a discussion. Yes, thank you so much. That was so informative. Um, we're going to move over to the Q&A portion. So if anyone has any questions, if you could please direct them to the Q&A chat, that would be great. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, I did have a question. So with exposures and exposure therapy protocols, homework is a big component of that. And I was wondering if you both have considered the application of this virtual reality um, is a take home for homework, given that right now you're using headsets that are tethered to the computer. In a, in a next step, yes. Um, to be honest, like our approach was very conservative in saying we first want to give it to the therapist, see how it works for them, see what feedback we get. And then we look into these ideas because we're still developing content and developing new ideas we're not at this step yet we think this is this is clearly and naturally something that every healthcare provider or financial person will ask or asks us is like can you automate automize it and can you just send it to the patient we could but for us this is basically skipping a step uh, we think right now it belongs into the into the hands of therapists and right now we we could then slim it down later on and give it to patients and do a standalone approach, yes. But right now it's the other way around. They do VR in the clinic and then they do homework outside as, as an icebreaker, basically. Okay, all right, thank you. And then I was also wondering, have you had any reports of um, cyber sickness, simulator sickness in your environments and how do you manage that? So we we actually had a study at the institute uh, where Thomas is a professor um, because it's the aging and cognition group. We had a good pool of um, patients or participants above 65, and because we know it's mainly acceleration, um, not not the speed um, and the the uh, yeah eye move like the, the movement of the environment in the um, how do you say? In the outside, uh, I'm, I'm you talking, the, yeah, you're talking about the mismatch between the vestibular and a visual cues. That, exactly, the, but it's yeah. very strong when it's in your peripheral view. Thank you. Uh, in, in your peripheral view. And that's why we, because the acceleration there will be the highest. So we control for that. And uh, the movement is rather slow, which we also realized is kind of a feature now because it's not nice for people with anxiety or with problems to approach something slowly. So their anxiety <clears throat> can build up slowly. And that's how we try to deal with it. And we don't have many problems with it actually. Okay. But maybe maybe to, to add to that, uh, we also have like a backup mode implemented in the software and that if someone is very, very sensitive, the therapist could also switch to a teleportation mode <clears throat> where the, sub, uh, the patient would be teleported from one location to the next. Um, obviously, you then lose this very gradual approach behavior, but it's something you can do to then eliminate basically the cyber sickness. Yeah. Mm. And how has the patient acceptance been? thus far of this product? We heard several practitioners say, yeah, nine out of 10, it makes sense. Uh, but with pre-selection, definitely by the therapists. Um, it's funny because um, we have a couple of child uh, therapists uh, who use it and the, the younger ones seem to be a little more critical about the software. They seem to be a little bit more, hey, I have a game at home that's much better. Um, but in general, the acceptance is very good, actually. And it's a nice treat, actually, also the therapists can give to patients as a, as a new approach to, to do therapy. Awesome. Great. So I'm going to now read um, some of the questions from the people in the audience. And the first one is from Alan who said, wonderful presentation. My question is regarding the therapist's voice to conserve a sense of presence in the patient in VR. Have you found a different a difference between the therapist being present in the room versus the therapist being present through a VR telemedicine model in conserving the sense of presence in the patient? With a telemedicine model, 
is meant that it's a, a video uh, or like that they speak to them or as an avatar in, in the virtual realm? Um, I'm not sure. I think talking about maybe through, yeah, maybe through um, an avatar, given that this is all done in the room. So we we didn't do that the that the therapist can actually be in the virtual environment as a representation. Um, what we did try in the beginning is that the microphone is connected to the to the headset and they can speak to the to the patient. Um, as Thomas already said, we we know that the the alliance is still there and the patient still realize that the therapist is in the room with them, which seems to be important. Um, which actually does both. Uh, some patients find it very uh, encouraging, but some patients also get nervous because they know they're doing something, the other person can see them and they can't see the other person. Um, but we didn't do a, a approach where the therapist is not in the room actually with our own system. Okay, thank you. And um, Efna Sheen asked, what software development stack is used? Unity, I think, is the answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and Sanya Rao said, can you talk about the evidence of impact on clinical outcomes thus far? For your app specifically, not in general for VR exposure therapy. So um, from what I understand, I know that uh, Dr. Wilbur shared just the overall uh, research on social anxiety and the outcomes with VR, but have you done any outcome measures within uh, with your model so far? Yeah, we also we have we, we do this in collaborations with uh, other academic partners, and we have some partners in in Finland actually have looked at okay how reliably can you induce anxiety with the software with the different scenarios. And um, this, it's not published yet, but this is looking very promising in terms of like EDA, in terms of like heart rate signals there. Um, we have other collaborations uh, with uh, University of Freiburg, I think, Philip, um, who, is, who is looking into various components, like which aspects of those social interactions, for example, which aspects are particularly uh, effective in, in inducing therapeutic effects. This is still ongoing work. And um, yeah, so that's kind of where we are at this stage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Sandra Wheeler said, given that notified bodies are really behind on VR knowledge, how did you find the medical device certification process if you've started that already? Okay, Philip, this for you. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, so we are um, a certified medical device, um, but under still under the German law. Now there was a change from the so-called MDD to MDR, which is the EU law. But the grace period, as they call it, is still ongoing. They prolonged it for another four years because they know that all the notified bodies can't get behind the work they have now because through this change, a lot of software or medical devices that weren't medical products or didn't need to be certified by a notified body now need to be certified by a notified body. And that's where this overflow comes from. We haven't done the the uh, transition yet so i can't talk about that i can tell you that it took us a year of one person working only on that and then we won the lottery of being tested by a german institute of a healthcare institute and it like we still didn't have everything and there were very detailed but depending on the class you're in you won't get like pulled off the market immediately because of our software being a medical device that is not intrusive, like doesn't work with a needle, doesn't really change the therapeutic uh, approach. Like it's not a diagnostics device that tells you what to do with the patient. That's why we're such a low level device that they told us to improve certain things, but they said it's, you still have a good uh, uh, like approach to your medical device certification and we're still a certified medical device yes but it's cumbersome very cumbersome yeah thank you um carla navarro asked what did you use as, as a development platform and what did you contemplate in the decision making process we used unity because adam said so 
um, basically because with, at the time, um, that's what Adam told us, we were all not that knowledgeable about development at the beginning, but it was still the go-to tool. I don't know if that changed right now, but it still seems to be from the, from the information load, from the graphics load, and from how easy it is developed forward to reality as a small team as we are, uh, we used Unity and it, it works rather well for us. Yeah, okay. Um, Russell and David asked, uh, social anxiety is just one topic. Do you have plans or ideas to extend your platform by addressing other topics like depression, other phobias? And I know you mentioned um, substance use disorders as well. Yes, um, so we are already also looking into phobias. Actually, Thomas, I, and the, the others are right now looking for an answer to what's actually the final product that we want to create. Like, where do we draw the line? We don't have a, a clear answer to that yet because you hear from so many therapists, um, patients, parents, clinicians, hey, there's this idea, there's that idea. And I think I'm the one who's always saying, yeah, but I only have this many years in me uh, to develop these things. Um, so we're talking about that right now. So what's a, a minimum product that you need to provide that is actually helpful to the, to the clinical landscape? And I think anxiety, we're trying to cover as much as possible. But because it's such a gruesome problem, alcohol use disorder and the relapse rates are so high, we also look into that if that can be actually a, a good treatment to prevent relapse because they don't have good tools there in, in, in therapy and psychiatry right now. Yeah, and, and to that point, um, Joe Morgan said, have you noticed any autonomic activation among people with alcohol use disorder going into these virtual environments? We actually have only started testing it. I can't tell you because we, we only started a study in Munich. I gave you actually real insight, uh, real-time insight into our development process. It's about to be given to patients in within the next days, actually. Um, so I can't tell you at this moment. Okay, that's for the next talk. <laughs> Two weeks. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> so Muhammad Mtiaz asked, isn't the wireless extension for the Vive Pro good enough to provide a seamless untethered experience? We had every 10th time it stopped working. And because we know how therapists react uh, when something stops working, they just drop it on the floor and call us. Um, and it, it happened regularly that we were just a black screen. Again, we just, at the moment, we ship out what has the least breaking points. Every breaking point you add, even if it just happens one in 10 times, because it's such a pioneer project, it's very crucial not to do it, in our opinion. Yeah. Because if you just have a black screen and can't explain why, the therapist will stop using it. And we, even if it just happens once during a crucial session, Right now it's rather stable and the cable is just more stable. It annoys everyone I know, but it's, yeah, again, uh, there we're always trying to balance UX with, it definitely has to work 100% or close to 100% of the time and easy yeah. to understand. That makes sense. And Sanja Rao, asks, can you talk about any concerns that patients or medical bodies may have surfaced regarding health data and biometric data privacy? For example, eye tracking, hand tracking, or other data that's collected during sessions. I mean, in Germany, we're very known for being very protective of our data. Here, it's, it's very strict. Uh, we did uh consulting for that and basically our software is protected in a way that it can only be run on a local device uh without being connected to the internet uh that is so no data can get out and we everything is protected well enough and that's what we always have to tell the clinic clinics and patients and also show what our standards are there, our security standards, and people seem to be happy with that um, approach. Okay, thank you. And Gary asked how many programmers and designers are on your team? <laughs> oh God, uh, not that many actually. And it's also partly freelancers. I don't know who to call designer and who not in the end. 
I would say we are two programmers, but then in the particular fields of animation, 3D art, voice acting, two programmers, and then five to six other designers. Wow. It's, it's hard to say. Um, okay. Um, and F. Nasheen um, asked, how do you test your products on devices or remote? I'm not sure about that question. But on devices, I mean, we, yeah. we tested first uh, extensively in the lab, but then if remote means we also send it out and see if people break it. We even did for the certification process, we did a session in two clinics where we filmed people using it and we looked how they use it and if everything works and we still uh, gather feedback if something is breaking we have this like feedback protocol um, where we then create a ticket list basically to, to eradicate the bug or whatever but testing starts internally then through different versions pre-alpha alpha and then beta and then release version that we send out and uh, with a back and forward then we come to the final version. Thank you. And our last question will be from an anonymous attendee. Any plans to expand to the US or other countries? <laughs> that sounds very sneaky, <laughs> an anonymous attendee. I know. Um, <laughs> um, somebody from a, from a VR therapy software from the US probably. Um, not at the moment, no. I mean, um, we're open for it. There are no... It would be easy for us, I would say, because we prepare to also use other languages because our software is very language heavy and language driven. Um, but at the moment, there's because we're still working on refining the product itself, we're not doing expansion at the moment. Okay. Well, thank you both so much. This has been really enlightening and very informative. I really appreciate your time and I'm going to turn it back over to Steve. Yeah, well, um, I, um, I, I, I was, um, as I expected, I was going to be impressed by, by the talk and um, uh, very interesting to see uh, very high resolution um, uh, VR being used in a, in a clinical sense, um, uh, which it, it's, uh, while I, I'm, I'm not sure that um, uh, that it's anything but an anecdotal observation, it seems like like um, many researchers are are taking the the, the, the same approach. Uh, so um, uh, very 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 interesting talk, um, uh, and thank you for uh, for for joining us, uh, Thomas and Philip. Um, uh, we. Um, uh, our talks all have the same theme, which is uh, while the tech technology might change and the field of, uh, of healthcare might change, uh, it's, uh, we, we tend to focus on the journey of uh, the uh, medical XR innovator. And this was uh, an excellent uh, opportunity for people to learn how to, um, how to take um, uh, an, an idea that began in, in, in the lab and give it wings and, uh, and, uh, and launch it in, in, into the world where it can do, do some good. Uh, so, so thank you very, very much for uh, sharing that. Um, and um, uh, Margo, thank you for joining as, um, as moderator. That, uh, uh, that, that really helped. Um, uh, it's, it's such an in-depth field, uh, having someone who uh, is, is well qualified like yourself to, uh, 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 to, to join us as moderator is, is very much appreciated. And to everyone who, who joined us, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the talk should be up on our website if you want to uh, review it uh, again. And uh, we, um, we look forward to seeing you at the next talk. And uh, thank, thank you again to our speakers and to our moderator. Uh, wish everybody a wonderful day. Thank you, thank so you for the invitation. Thanks for the invitation. That was great. Thank you. My pleasure.